We continue this morning with our series on the book of Hebrews that we've just entitled Entering His Rest. And it's very important for us, the church, to preach God's word faithfully. And there are different churches that use different ways of preaching. It doesn't mean that if someone preaches slightly more topically that it's necessarily wrong. But throughout the year, we'll preach on certain topics, yes, but mostly you want to preach God's word and preach it verse by verse or chapter by chapter, text by text. And that's what we want to focus on. And therefore, it's important that when we come to church, we are aware that we're just going through the text in what it says. And that's what we have to focus on. And there's so much to be understood with the background and who the author is writing to, what is writing about to them, and that's important. That's why it's important to read the Bible. If we want stories, that's fine. You can go listen to stories, but if you want to hear God's Word and really focus on God's Word, it's going to take a bit of time. It's going to take a bit of time to understand. Whenever we read, I read with my son at night, and um, I know it's, it's pretty sacrilege, but I, I really struggle with the famous five. I do. And how it's written especially late at night. I'm just struggling to read it properly. I sound like a, a, a sort of a year R when I'm reading it. But when you read the famous five, there's so much that you have to try and understand about the context of the times. In every book that you read, you understand the context of times and the language that's being used. And that's the same with the scriptures. And that's why it's important for us to really hear what God has to say and really try and, and see what he is saying. And that's why this passage is important to us today as it was last week in starting Hebrews chapter 7. And the whole point of Hebrews chapter 7 is the author is driving home that Jesus Christ is superior. He's superior to Abraham. He was superior to angels. He's superior to all the patriarchs and superior now even to the priesthood of Levi. Now, again, the author assumes that those he's writing to, that's why the book is called the book of Hebrews, they know about the priesthood. They know about the sacrifices. They understand what the law is. And that is why it's important to read the Bible. Because, un unfortunately, we think that the Bible as a whole is written to unbelievers. No, it's not. The Bible is written to believers. What we declare to unbelievers is what the Bible tells us to declare. But the Bible is not written for unbelievers to sit and go, oh, wow, I'm just going to open a passage here and know exactly what it's talking about. We need to know systematically what it is saying. And therefore, as God's people, we read his word. And here, the author assumes that his hearers, who are Jewish believers, know about the priesthood. And so if you are here this morning and you don't fully understand that, it's fine. It's going to take time. And you can go read about that. Go read the book of Leviticus to really have a nice exercise. But it will tell you all the things that you need to know. So it's not, this is not hidden knowledge or the minister is very clever. He knows things. No, the Bible tells you these things. It's just going to take a bit of work to go and look at those things. So today we are considering a very important topic in the text. And I've just entitled the message, New Covenant, New Priesthood. New Covenant, New Priesthood. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. We're reading from verse 11 to 22. New covenant, new priesthood. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Why? Because the priests came from Levi, not from Judah. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 
On the one hand, there is an annulling, annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. But so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Now, there's a very important principle in the Bible. It doesn't matter when you look at Scripture where we are. There's one very important principle from Genesis to Revelation. Whatever the theological implications might be at a certain time, as the Bible is a progressive revelation, what doesn't change is this very principle, that faith approaches God on His terms. What God has set out, faith responds to that. Adam and Eve, they leave the garden. They've got their fig leaves on not sufficient. God sacrifices an animal and gives them a covering. They receive that covering. Faith responds. Cain and Abel, God says, sacrifice an animal. Don't bring your vegetables to me. God's not into veggie things. Bring, your, bring, bring me a sacrifice. What does Abel do? Abel makes a sacrifice. Faith responds to what God says at the time. To Noah, God says, a flood's coming, build an ark. What does faith do? Faith builds an ark. That's the principle. Today, what is the principle? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So we approach God on his terms. If you want to approach God on your own terms, that's fine. You're just going to come short. So if you want to be super religious, you can go be super religious. That's not God's terms. If you want to prove your own righteousness, you can go do that. That's not God's terms. God's terms is the Lord Jesus Christ only. So faith approaches God on his terms, that which is revealed at a specific time. Now, as we read the Old Testament, God gives the nation of Israel clear instructions. He gives them instructions of how to approach him and how to construct their worship. Very simple. That's what God does. So when you read the Old Testament and the term law, it's not just for people to live under this law, but it's also the principle and the process of how to approach God. Who's allowed to approach him at a certain time? How should he be approached? And if you don't follow through with that, there are consequences because of God's holiness and God's righteousness. It is his terms. What does faith do? Faith goes on his terms. If Noah said, yes, God, I believe in you, but I'm going to make a speedboat because I think it's a boat. But God gives him instructions. I'm not interested in your instructions. I want to build a speedboat. And so many people have that when it comes to worship. Yeah, I know what the Bible says, but I think it's this. Not for you to think. It's for you to follow. So the New Testament then brings in a new instruction for us. But the same foundation. This is very important. I think it's logical when we read the Bible, we understand things have changed in the Bible between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 100%, in the structure of approach. But the principle remains exactly the same. It is God's terms. So if you want to debate theology, you want to wrestle with people theologically, and it's all awkward, the question we have to ask is, what does the Bible say? And what is the, the, the principle and foundation that God has given? And that's what we debate. Not what you like and what I like. It's what the Bible says. That's the key point. And that's why this passage is so important. Because if you were living 2,000 years ago and you were Jewish, if you are, muzzle tov. If you're not, you're like me, a Gentile. But if you were a Jewish believer at the time and you read these sort of 11, 12 verses, this is very serious what's being said here. We as non-Jews are reading this and going, oh, okay, well, that's normal. It's not normal. Because what the author is saying, what the writer of Hebrews is saying, there is a change now in the whole structure of worship. This is something that they've been with them for thousands of years. And the writer is saying, God is saying it's changing. And you know how everyone loves change. We can't even change the carpets in the church and people will lose their minds. God's not changing carpets here. He's not changing curtains. He's torn a curtain. But he's not changing curtains. He's changing the whole structure of worship. How do you think the Jews are going to respond? 
How does faith respond? Faith responds by saying, yes, Lord, I follow what you're saying. Humanity says, no, I don't like this. Why, why do you think we have the issues? Why did the early church have issues? Why did Israel struggle? Because God came and brought a sledgehammer, not to the law, we're going to deal with the law now, but not to, to the good things or the moral side, but the very structure of how to approach him, God takes a sledgehammer to. And they don't like that. So when we use the term law, and it's important that we understand this. So when we use the term law, what does that mean? So many people say we're not under the law, but we're under grace. What does that mean? Because it makes absolutely no sense if you make that statement. It's scriptural, and we'll deal with that. But we're not under the law. So I can lie. Is that okay? I can steal. I can commit adultery. It's okay, because I'm not under the law. No one logically thinks that. That's what is so funny. So when you preach grace, everyone's like, oh, so you're saying the law is not applicable. What person thinks like that? Of course, the moral law is applicable. How can you say it's not? Can we lie to each other in the fellowship here? Is that okay? Can we cheat? No, no one's saying that. But what does it mean when the Bible speaks about the law? What does the term law mean? And what does it mean to follow the law? Because everyone knows that every single Christian understands the moral dynamic. Whether you follow it or not, everyone knows that the Ten Commandments, the moral side of the Ten Commandments, is completely applicable to normal life. No one debates that issue. But the law is not just the Ten Commandments, is it? Is the Lord Ten Commandments? No, it's not. 613 of them. Everyone's very gutsy with the Ten. I'm like, okay, you got the other ones? Are you about the other 603? What clothes are you wearing? What are you eating? So many things. So when we use the term law, some think it's the Ten Commandments. Some think it's, it's only the religious laws of Israel. And others think it's the structure of society. And you know what? It's all of the above. When you use the term law, you're dealing with the Ten Commandments, which is the foundational moral principle. When you deal with the law, you're dealing with the Levitical structure of, of sacrifices and worship. Yes, that's also the law. And the third part of the law, which is important, and Christians tend to sidestep that issue, is the civil part of what the law is. Because when God called Israel and brought them out of Egypt, he gave them the law as a way to structure that society. It was a constitution for Israel to function as a people. So the very laws you read is a constitution. Of course, we don't always fully understand constitutions because some are written and some are not. But Israel had a written constitution. So when we say we are not under the law, but we're under grace, and that you'll find, of course, in Galatians 6. Is it there? No, it's not that one. I'm sorry, Jim. I knew it was wrong. Um, don't worry about that verse. But in the book of Galatians 6, it says you're not under law, but you're under grace. Don't worry about that verse. The key is, what are we talking about? Can we say the Christian is not under the moral law? Of course we're under the moral law. Because why did God give the moral law? He gave the moral law so Israel could stay together as a society. Why were people not allowed to lie? Because that destroys society. Why did God... Say, you're not supposed to commit adultery. Why? Because it destroys society. Why are you not supposed to murder? It destroys society. So the moral framework is there for us in the Christian community, 100%. But we're dealing here not just with the moral part. We're dealing with the civil part as well, which is another conversation on its own. Because if we dealt with civil law, we don't function like that. Even though the Western world functions on a Judeo-Christian framework, you know, we don't follow it 100% biblically. We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be able to function as a society because we're dealing with different nations. But what is the passage dealing with here? What is the passage dealing with in the context of Hebrews 7 when it speaks about the law? It's not dealing with the moral law. It's not dealing with the civil law. It is dealing with the religious law. That's important. So when it says there's a change needed of the law, it's not talking about the moral part not talking about the civil part it's talking about the religious part because what is the context of the passage it's dealing with the priesthood what was the priesthood's responsibility to guide israel in its worship and religious part okay so again when someone comes and thinks they're a clever aleck uh, by saying oh so you're saying we're not under the law i'll be like okay which one are you what, what are you talking about when you talk about the law 
because it sounds like such a clever statement. And people, especially as a church, we, we, we preach grace. And God's grace is salvation, not legalism. We're not here to preach legalism. And then you have those clever sort of religious people that come and say, well, what are you then saying? I'm asking, what are you saying? Because ultimately, we are all under the moral side of the law. That's how it should function within the, in the church and within any part of society, really. But we're talking here about other things. So I want you to think with me before we get into the text, just from a, a contextual side. So to try and take yourself back 2,000 years ago. Now, the, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish believers. That's established. But do we think that these Jewish believers were only saved when the writer wrote to them? And what I mean by that is, how young do you think these folk are in the book of Hebrews? Are they all sort of 20 year olds, 30 year olds, or are they of mature age? So, what would have happened is many of them would have grown up with Judaism without knowing about Jesus, because when the book of Hebrews is written, it's written sort of about probably 60s AD. Now, let's say someone was born in the year four or five. They'd be about 60, let's say 70 years old, which was okay then. Let's say they're 70 years old. They grew up in a time when the name Jesus wasn't even mentioned. They didn't even know who he was. So they had come from a Judeo, Judeo structure, a Jewish structure, then they hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are then saved, and they are saved as Jews. So they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But they don't know the fullness of Christianity yet because a lot of these people weren't sort of super keen on pork-eating people just joining them. Then Paul the Apostle sort of lays the foundation of greater teaching. So many people 2,000 years ago went from being Jewish to being messianic, believing that Jesus is the Messiah, but you're still Jewish, very strongly Jewish, to then understanding what Christianity is. So they went through three specific phases of their understanding. We don't understand it. You might sit here, what are you talking about? Of course, we're not going to understand because we're living 2,000 years later. But at the time of Christ, people were Jews. They weren't Christians. Then they believe in Jesus. He's the Messiah. You are Jewish that believes in Jesus as the Messiah. Then... Jesus dies. He rises again. Paul the Apostle, specifically with the other apostles, but Paul being the main thrust of this, brings in Christian teaching. And then you go from just being Jewish in your understanding of the Messiah to now saying, yes, I'm Jewish. Yes, I believe he's the Messiah. But now I understand what the body of Christ is, which means people that eat pork and dress funny can also join. So there are three specific phases these people went through. So when the author of Hebrews is writing here, he's shaking the very foundation of his hearers in what he's saying. And what I love about how God works is he does not care about those who are going to be funny. He's speaking to those who are hearing. Him that has ears, let him hear. Him that is funny, that's also in the Bible, no, it's not. Him that is funny must walk along. So if Jews wanted to fight with God, they're going to lose. And it's a very strong statements that are made. So let's look at the passage. Firstly, what we see from verse 11 to 17 is a change in priesthood brings a change in law. And verse 11 really sort of launches us into this. Listen to the terminology. I would love to have just, actually what I could have done for the sermon is print out the commentary that I, that I looked at that was so good. I could just give you the commentary and we can go home because the person says it's so much better. It says, therefore, if perfection, perfection, how is the word perfection used there? Can any, can any person be perfect? No, he's using it for completeness. So he's using it in the terms of being saved or your sins being forgiven, that whole understanding. So therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, if we could be perfect and righteous before God through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest, or that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? So, of course, the context of, of, of the early part of chapter 7 deals with Jesus Christ being a high priest, our high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. 
what the writer is saying is, if perfection was to the Levitical priesthood, to the Old Testament, why then does Jesus come as a high priest? It's not needed, is it? But the very reason why Jesus comes to be a high priest is because it's needed, because the old system could not make people right before God. Couldn't. So perfection was not possible under the Levitical priesthood. So you couldn't be complete, which means forgiven, and neither could you have absolution. You could not have absolute forgiveness. And what's so beautiful about the people asking, how were people saved in the Old Testament? They were saved on credit. And I know it's difficult for most British people to understand because British folk generally are very good with their money. I love it. South Africans love living in the red. That's how we function. Savings. Who saves? That's why the country functions a lot better than South Africa's, because you're very good with money. But generally what happens is the Old Testament, people were saved on credit because their actions in the Old Testament, the priesthood and people responding to the priesthood, God counted that as righteous because of Christ to come, but it wasn't in itself going to save. So you were saved with the anticipation of a payment being made in the future. Makes sense. So they were saved, but it wasn't that that could forgive their sins because the, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. So the writer here is saying that if the Levitical priesthood, the Old Testament was perfect and could just save people, there was no need for a new priesthood. But God brought in a new high priest who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. And this is what the Jews would struggle with. The hearers here, yes, they are Jewish. Yes, they're Christian, so they might understand. But who they're going to speak to are going to lose their minds. These believers here, when they receive this and they're going to share it with their Jewish friends, it's going to be all madness. There's some verses on this. Hebrews 10 verse 9. Jim's going to just put them up on the screen. So Hebrews 10 verse 9. And it says, Then he said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He, take away, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. What is the first there? It's the old covenant. Okay. Then let's look at Acts chapter 6, verse 14. This is probably where my Galatians 6, 14 came in. Jim, I'm sorry. This is Stephen. And when Stephen sort of starts preaching and people start preaching, listen to the terminology here. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Did Jesus change the moral custom? No. Did Jesus ever change the civil custom? No. Because when you're living in Israel, there's a civil structure. But what did Jesus come to change? The religious structure. And like that. You can go read there what happened to Stephen. If you want to know what it means in Israel 2,000 years ago to say it's only through Jesus. It's very similar to what happened in the Dark Ages when you said it's only through Jesus. Go read the Fox's Book of Martyrs to what the Roman Catholic Church did to those who said it's only Christ alone. Acts chapter 21, verse 20 to 21. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. This is Acts 20, or 21, many years. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. And that was a lie. Paul never said the Jews must not circumcise their children. How do we know that? Because Timothy was a preacher with him who was Jewish, and, and his father was Gentile, but his mother was Jewish. And Paul took him and circumcised him so that he could go into the temple and still preach and stuff. So when you were a Jew, there were still customs that would apply and people would be part of that structure. If you're a Gentile, it's different. 
But the key here is that look how they respond. So how do you think the audience here would respond to what's being said here? It'd be quite prickly, wouldn't it? Because verse 12 then says, For the priesthood being changed from Levi to Christ or Melchizedek, of necessity there's also a change of the law. What defined Israel as a nation? What defined them? When was their birth? Everyone thinks the birth was Abraham. No. The birth of Israel was when they left Egypt. That's technically the birth of Israel. What defined them? What was the moment that defined them as a nation? Was God's covenant with them? Not so. That covenant that was given to them on Mount Sinai. That defined them. And look at the, what the author says in verse 12. Change in priesthood, guess what? Change in the law. Everything that you know, everything that you believed in, everything that held you together as a person in the covenant that you have received, the author is saying that's changing. Talk about shaking people to their core. Verse 13 then goes on, For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Now that I don't have to give you big instruction on that. The text is clear. All the priests came from Levi. Jesus was born from Judah, where the kings were born from. That priesthood ends. It fulfills its purpose. A new priest rises, who's the Lord Jesus Christ, from the tribe of Judah. And because he rises from Judah, there's a necessity for a change of the law because the Levites have fulfilled their purpose. Do you also understand why the Jews held on to so many things? If you were a Levite, or you were Caiaphas, and suddenly you know there's a change coming, what are you going to do? Oh, yes, no, I love the change. So it's the same as... Let's say uh, the church, the members come to me saying, Kenneth, there's a change that's needed. How would I respond? We don't want you to be on the pulpit every Sunday. There's a change needed. We're going to sort of give you a sprinkling of once a month, maybe. How would my natural response be? No, 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 no. And here it's sort of saying to the priest, sorry, your job is done. So do we see why the Jews and the leaders fought against Christ? Because the change was coming. Winds of change was blowing. Verse 15 goes on. For it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who is Christ, of course, who has come not according to the law of fleshly commandments, but according to the power of an endless life. That's important because the priests in the Old Testament were put in place because God gave that structure of ordinances, of the way that they must be followed, of also it was hereditary. So your father was a priest, you become a priest, you're from the tribe of Levi, and specifically for the high priest, you must be from the tribe of Levi, yes, but also from the lineage of Aaron. There's a fleshly aspect, a physical aspect to this. And here the writer is saying that he has come not according to the fleshly commandments. So Christ did not follow the structure of a normal priest in the Old Testament. But his position comes according to the power of an endless life. And what I love about the word endless in the Greek, it means indestructible or permanent in the Greek. That's what endless means. Because what does the Bible say about Melchizedek's priesthood? He had no father. He had no mother. His priesthood was forever. The Levitical priesthood is temporary. It's going to fall away, which it did. Jesus Christ has come as a high priest, and his priesthood is because of an endless life. It is permanent. It is indestructible. It's an eternal priesthood. And then he quotes, of course, here in verse 17, that then says, For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And this is very important. The Old Testament priests, the Old Testament religious structure, the sacrifices, that was temporary. It fell away. Jesus Christ has come. His sacrifice is eternal. His priesthood is eternal. We don't have to wait for anything else to come. 
or anyone else. It is only now through Christ. And that's the basis of the gospel. So today might be slightly technical for some, but it's basically the gospel. The gospel is, it's about Jesus Christ. Go to him. If you go outside of him, you're in trouble. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection, his priesthood, it's about him. It's very simple. If you choose to do anything outside of what God has declared about the Lord Jesus Christ, you will suffer the consequences. Verse 18 to 19, the second point, is an imperfect priesthood brings imperfect sacrifices. Or imperfect priesthood and imperfect sacrifices. Verse 18 and 19. For it says, for on the one hand, there is an annulling. Now, annulling is a strong word. Now, normally people use the term annulled for it ceases to exist or it never existed almost. But annulling in the Greek means it's no longer in effect. That's what the word annulling means. Now, this is what the Bible says. For on the one hand, there is an annulling, or it's of no effect, of the former commandment. And why? Why did the Levitical system, the sacrifices, why did that have to fall away? Why did it have to fulfill its purpose? Why did it have to come to an end? The reason why is because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. That's why. And why was it weak? What does the word weak mean there? Inefficient. Inefficient. Go back to verse 11. It says, therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood could not bring forgiveness and perfection and completeness and closeness. It couldn't bring that. That's why it is weak. And that also is why it is unprofitable. It had no gain. The Levitical system had no gain for the people. It only reminded you of your sin. Why? Because once a year you had to go on the Day of Atonement for 359 days. A Jewish year is 360 for those who think that he doesn't know his years. A Jewish prophetic year is 360 days. So for 359 days, you, you recognize I'm in my sin, I'm in my sin, I'm stressed out, it's difficult and I'm carrying this burden. And then on the Day of Atonement, everyone goes and receives atonement. And guess what? Then the next day, it starts again, day one. I've got 359 days to worry about. Because the system was ineffective. So here in verse 18, when it speaks about the former commandment. It's talking not about the Ten Commandments, but the Levitical system of commandments. And verse 19 says, for the law made nothing perfect. That's why the word law there, what is the term law? It's not speaking about the Ten Commandments. It's not talking about the moral side. Now, of course, the moral side we know can't make anyone perfect. It's just God's structure. But it's not talking about the law in connection with the moral side. It's saying here, for the law is the Levitical system. Made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a, that was very dramatic, Wally, I like it. Wally and I, were, we, we practiced that one on the way here. Look at verse 19, and I want, I want you to, to, to sort of, I want to, to grasp this. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope. Better hope. So why do I emphasize that? Because what could not be more frustrating is if Christians and churches want to take people back to an old hope. If you want to be legalistic as a Christian, you are going backward. The Christian responsibility is not to go backward, but to look toward the better hope. If you live under guilt and shame and all the sin and it's, oh, woe me, and you want to do some self-flagellation and walk around with a long lip because you just feel like so horrible and a sinner and everyone in church tells you how horrible you are, the minister even tells you how horrible you are, what you are doing is you're going backward. Because the Christian must move toward the better hope, sins forgiven, a finished work. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. So again, I'm not impressed by Christians who want to be super, oh yeah, we have to be super strong. Yeah, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with being focused on righteousness. But if you focus on righteousness to take people backward, then I'm very worried for you. 
because you're actually then going against scripture because the scriptures tell us to go forward toward the better hope. So there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw. This is the key one. I'm super excited about this verse. This should have just been the sermon, verse 19. Because look at this. So the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. What is the reference there? The reference of drawing near to God is the day of atonement. Now I have to focus on that briefly again. On the day of atonement, the priest goes, he takes off all his priestly garments. He only has his linen on. He makes a sacrifice for himself. He goes into the Holy of Holies and puts the blood on the mercy seat. He comes out and he makes a sacrifice for the people, takes that blood and puts it on the mercy seat. But he's the only one that can go to the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat is. He's the only one that can go there. The people have to wait outside because they can't draw near to God. Same as on Mount Sinai. Who was the only one to go up the mountain? Moses. The people had to stay away from the mountain. Because no one could draw near. Until when? Until the curtain? Tore in two. Until Jesus said, it is finished. Now everyone can draw near because we're drawing near in Christ. And that's what verse 19 says. And there is the bringing in of a better hope through which now we can draw near to God. So if you want to go backwards and live in the old covenant, that's fine. And there is a sort of attitude with that. I'm, I'm all for you know, being, we have to have gravity when it comes to things. Like I don't want smoke machines and weirdness. That's not what church should be. Church is not a circus. If you want to go, go, go to a circus, you want to go to a circus. You want to come to church, you come to church. But it's also not for us to create this Barrier, when if someone comes in church, you're not allowed to smile. Because you know you're on holy ground. So we actually got some shoe racks outside. So when you come in, you've got to put your shoes out there. Don't joke. Have you seen worship people in church? The women normally don't have shoes on. Have you seen it? It's weird. Because they think it's holy ground. The pulpit's holy ground, so they don't have their, sh their shoes on. It's super weird. Or they just want to show their feet off. It's weird. But this whole concept is, ooh, no, no, no. We're not trying to create false barriers or false, ooh, holiness things. We are near to God with seriousness and gravity and worship and praise, but with the knowledge that we are close. There are no more barriers between God and me. Nothing stops me from being close to the Lord, fellowshipping with him, walking with him. And that's what verse 19 says. And to the Jew, that was very serious. And we conclude then, verse 20 to 22. It says, And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests with, without an oath, but he with an oath, by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest according or forever according to the order of Melchizedek. It's very interesting, this. Very interesting. Now, generally, when a pastor becomes a pastor of a church, there is a commitment that is made. And normally, the passage that will be, be read will be Second Timothy, probably. You know, preach the gospel in season, out of season. You make a commitment to shepherd God's people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in the Old Testament, the priests did not make an oath because their priesthood was not based upon their oath. It was based upon their lineage and it was hereditary. So your father was a priest, you become a priest and so on and so on. And the character of the child was not even debated. It was only basically that your father was a priest. If it was a complete juvenile delinquent, they normally would get teachers in to guide the child. But generally, the priesthood was hereditary. That's why, again, for interest's sake, I read this to my son. When you read the account of, of Samuel being called by God and he keeps going to Eli and Eli sends him back and he goes back and the Lord says, and then Eli says to Samuel, it's the Lord that's calling you and say, yes, Lord, here I am. And when he says that the Lord reveals to Samuel at a young age that Eli is going to die and his sons because Eli did not correct his sons when they were blaspheming in the temple as priests. But his sons were juvenile delinquents, but they were priests because they were his sons. 
So here it's saying that the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ is not based on just a hereditary Levitical system, but it's based upon an oath. Priests don't make an oath, but God made an oath. And God promised in his word that a priest will come after. And it's quite interesting that Moses, did he not say that the prophet will come after as well? So something was to come. A prophet, yes, but also a priest. As David promised, a king. Prophet, priest, and king was to come. And here the priests don't take an oath. But God made an oath and he promised in his word that a plan would be there to be fulfilled in the priesthood of Christ. That in Christ sins are forgiven. In Christ there is closeness and we can draw near to God. In Christ there is righteousness. In Christ there is reconciliation. In Christ there is grace and truth. In Christ there is everything that we might need. And then verse 22. Verse 22 is that moment, which is the sledgehammer that says, by so much more, Jesus, and it would have been so much better actually in, in Hebrew, but it's not stronger, by so much more, Yeshua has become, now why I say Yeshua to the, to the years, they'd be very strong. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. What does the word surety mean? Guarantee. That's what it means. That Jesus Christ in his life, his death, his resurrection, his priesthood, and everything who he is, he is the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, of course, there's another sermon series on its own about dealing with the new covenant. And there are many views and things like that dealing with the new covenant. And we're not going to get into that because that's going to open. Talk about Michael and I joke about cans of worms. Whew, the new covenant will open some serious cans of worms. But what was the promise? Turn with me if you have your Bibles. Otherwise, we'll be on the screen. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. It's a passage we should know as, as God's people. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. You want to know where Jeremiah is? You find Psalms. You were slightly to the right. You find Isaiah. You get Jeremiah. It's there. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. So what the writer of Hebrews is saying is not unique. Not sort of, oh, where are you coming from with this? It's biblical. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Why does it use the two terms? Why does it say Israel and Judah? It's very important because the nation was split in two and the covenant is not just with Judah. The covenant is with Israel as well. It's, the, it's, the, it's bringing the two together, the tribes together. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. You see Egypt, the connection there of the old covenant. My covenant, which they broke, though as a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So when is this covenant going to be fulfilled? If you just read verse 33 as what it says, they will be my people. Are they? So it's still coming. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother. That's quite interesting. Why, why does it say no man shall teach his neighbor? Isn't our responsibility to carry the gospel out? So this is not talking about this time because we should carry the gospel. This is talking about a time when Jesus is on the throne. We don't need to preach. Why? Because you can just point them to Jerusalem where Christ is seated. It's talking about the kingdom. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Let's look at Hebrews 8, verse 6, as we conclude. So Hebrews 8, verse 6 on the screen there. 
We're going to get here. It says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. So the writer of Hebrews is driving home that Jesus Christ came to bring in something better. To bring in a new covenant and something better. Now, yes, as the Christian, we don't have all the dynamics of the new covenant because we're not living in the kingdom per se. But the principle is there that a change has taken place from the sacrificial system of the Levites to a system of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ only. So the question I leave with you today is, are we confident as Christians that that is the righteousness of God? Do you believe that the righteousness of God is manifested and displayed in the person of Christ? Do you believe the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God, all the good things of God is manifested and displayed in the person of Christ? Is it our responsibility personally to be the righteousness of God? You can't be the righteousness of God. Because guess what? We are not righteous. But in Christ, in Christ, we are righteous. In Christ, we can manifest righteousness. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And why I say that is because we have to be confident that to preach the gospel and the gospel being believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, Acts 16, 31. Are you confident that is the gospel? Or is it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Plus, you need to do all this other stuff. You have to come to church at least 50 times a year. Those two times will let you go for being unwell. You have to be praying every single day on your knees. Unless you do that, you're in trouble. And it's all this pressure of do, 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 do. And if you don't do enough, then... The other Christians will know that you actually don't have the fruits that meet for righteousness. And then we write it in the big black book in the church. Stress. Are you confident that the gospel is solely based on Christ's work? But the only priesthood that we need is the priesthood of Christ, an eternal one, a finished work. And then we look to him and we point others to a system or to Christ, point them to Christ, and we rest in him. I trust that you do that. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word to us today. We thank you for the newness that you have brought in. New life. Being able to live in the newness. Because, Lord Jesus, you've given your life. And help us, Lord, to remind ourselves to identify with your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And help us to live in that newness. Help us, Lord, not to go back. Help us not to hold on to religious things for religious things' sake. But help us to trust you and live in the grace and the knowledge of something better that has come. And you, Lord, you are the better. And we hold on to you. And I pray for everyone here. I pray for the religious people among us who really feel very religious. And I pray for them. And I pray that they will trust only in the Lord Jesus Christ and not in their own righteousness. I pray for those who don't feel very religious or don't feel very righteous or feel that they're just not good enough. And I pray for you and pray that you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is your righteousness. And I pray for those who don't know the path, are struggling with the whole Christian thing, struggling to trust. I pray for you, and I can't help you today in the sense of I can't make you believe or trust. But I'm just here to declare that it is only through Christ and turn to him, believe in him, believe in his death and resurrection, and therein you will find everything that you need. Therein you'll find salvation, and therein you'll find hope, and therein you will find salvation and forgiveness of your sin 
guilt will be taken away. You can live in newness. I pray, Lord, for all of us that we will just turn to you. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand, Park, and greeting song.